Hello everyone and welcome. This video will talk about Bayes' theorem and give an illustrative example in L.S. Clothiers. But first, why Bayes' theorem? What is it and why would we, why would we use it? Well, Bayes' theorem is used when we are given initial or prior probabilities, but then new information. And with this new information, we can calculate better or updated posterior probabilities. So that's the idea. Start out with prior probabilities, then from some kind of sample, report, test, etc., we obtain additional information, and then we calculate revised or posterior probability. Bayes' theorem provides the means for revising this prior probability, and so these four bullet points are sort of a flowchart. Start out with prior probabilities, then we get a sample, new information, we go to posterior probabilities through Bayes' theorem. So I suppose the fourth bullet point is really the third item. Prior probabilities, new information, application of Bayes' theorem into posterior probabilities. So that's the idea. So LS Clothiers is a, uh, a downtown clothing business, um, and there's a pr proposed shopping center um, a little ways away um, that may provide um, some strong competition for the downtown businesses. Um, now this hasn't been built yet, it's proposed, um, and if it is, but if it is built, then uh, the owner of LS Clothiers feels that it would be best to move from downtown to this shopping center that he believes will um, have a, a higher foot traffic or, or otherwise higher demand. However, the shopping center cannot be built unless a zoning change is approved by the town council. So the planning board will make a recommendation for or against the zoning change, and then the council makes a decision. Okay, so there's this important two-step process here. Planning board's recommendation, and then council's decision. So that gives us an opportunity to apply Bayes' theorem in the interim. So let's say that we know just from either some combination of you know data, um, circumstantial evidence, subjective judgment, um, we end up with a 70% chance that the town council approves the zoning change, and we call that event A1, um, and there's a 30% chance that the town council will disapprove the change with a value of A2, an event A2. So you see that summary here, um, your descriptions of the variables and the associated probabilities. A1 approval, A2 disapproval, probabilities are 70 and 30 percent respectively. Now let's say that we find out that the planning board has recommended against the zoning change. Let's denote a new event B, which means that the planning board has given a negative recommendation. Given that a negative recommendation has been given, given that B has occurred, should LS Clothiers revise the probabilities that the town council will approve or disprove the zoning change? Well, the short answer is yes. Past history with the planning board and the town council indicates the following. If we look at the times in which the final decision by the council was approval, we see that there was a 20% chance that the initial recommendation was negative. Um, now, if we see that a final decision, the council's final decision was to disallow the zoning change, then there was a 90% chance that the original recommendation was negative. Which means we can infer that of all the times when there was a final approval, then we have B complement, which is the opposite of B, B being a negative recommendation, therefore B complement is a positive recommendation. So this means the probability of a final approval given a recommendation of approval is 80%. So if we know it ended with, a, with an approval, there's an 80% chance that the um, recommendation was positive. Similarly, if we know that the final decision, the final decision was negative, then we can say that the uh, probability of it ending, I'm sorry, of it starting with a positive recommendation is uh, a mere 10 percent. So, if we know that they ended up disapproving, then they almost certainly approved. So you can see that these numbers are: it's one minus this is that, one minus this is that. So we have these four numbers and we're going to need them in our formula. So that's why we've computed them. They might not sound very useful because in some ways they're the opposite of what you need. But what you'll see in just a moment is that 
while we're, they're not what we want to have, we need them to compute the values that we do want to have. So if we look at this as a tree diagram, we see that there are two initial recommendations, um, which is approval and disapproval, and then we have the town council's final decision. But because we're looking at things from the other direction, we're looking at the town council to the planning board, we put them in this order. Again, this is so that it matches our um, uh, the information from the previous slide. We need to do them in this order. Functionally, it doesn't matter, um, but it makes more sense when you have the conditional probabilities, when you, when you say this, and then you use this as the condition. So it makes sense to do whatever is the condition, A1 or A2, um, on the branch. So that's by far the, the way that makes more sense. In fact, I'm not sure if it's possible to make a coherent tree chart another way. Um, I guess it's possible. It's just silly. It makes more sense to say prior and then or, you know condition and then result. That makes more sense. So um, since we're using conditions on the final decision, that needs to go first. Anyway. So if we multiply this number times this number, this is the multiplication rule. This gives us the intersection. So 0 0.7 times 0 0.2 is the equivalent to 2 times 7, 14, and you move the decimal place 2 over. So having A1 and B occurring at the same time has a 14% chance. Similarly, A1 and B complement is 56%. A2 and B is 27%. A2 and B complement is 3%. Of course, if we add them all up, we'll find that it's 100%, which is good because that's that's what we should have. And each of our probabilities needs to be um, uh, between 0 and 1. So we have a valid probability distribution. And since these all add up to 100, we've got a pretty good shot that um, hopefully we haven't made any mistakes in our arithmetic. So we now have all the values we need. So we're looking at these, uh, these two columns here. We have all the information we need to fill out Bayes' theorem which I haven't shown you yet. So perhaps this is the time. So to find the posterior probability that event AI will occur, given that event B has occurred, we apply Bayes' theorem, which looks a little sort of something like this. Now, don't be alarmed. I know it's uh, intimidating. But uh, this is uh, not as bad as it looks. Um, and it's kind of like you know, the variance formula, excuse me, the variance, for variance formula, um, where you just need a big table. Um, or in the case of this example problem, a small table actually will do. Um, now, as a caveat, there are two criteria that have to criteria, excuse me, that have to exist before we can use Bayes' theorem. Number one, um, the events. Uh, oops, go back. Try that again. The events for which we want to compute posterior probabilities, they must be a mutually exclusive and B, their union must be the entire sample space. So those two things must, 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 be, must be the case. So if you think about this, what are our possibilities? Well, um, either there's an approval or a disapproval. Can those happen at the same time? No, it's one or the other. And it's one or the other. There's no third option. Then you might be thinking, well, what if they pocket veto? What if they just choose not to vote? Well, eventually, that's exactly what a pocket veto is. Eventually, it times out, so to speak, uh, or it is a failure to approve, which is equivalent to a non-approval. Things don't change. So um, really, that's, that's it. It's either approval or it's disapproval with some time lag maybe in there for either opportunity. So ignoring the effect of time, it's either approval or not approval. So those are your two choices. So we're checked on both of those two things. We're good to go. Let's, uh, let's move on to the juicy part. So given the planning board's recommendation not to approve, so to, to, to disapprove the zoning change, we can revise the prior probabilities as follows. So in the previous formula, we had this dot, dot, dot thing where we had to plug in all the values that were applicable. But because we only have two events, we only need to have two items here on the uh, denominator. So uh, we have probability of A1 given B is just the probability of A1 times probability B given A1. So it's the first number stays here by itself. And then you put this thing again, but you flip them. OK, so probability of A1, that's here. Probability of B given A1 
goes in this position. And then we copy this entire thing and put it on the bottom. It's exactly the same. See, probability of A1, prob probability of B given A1. Probability of A1, probability of B given A1. Same thing, exactly the same. So the only thing we have to change is we have to add in on the denominator, we have to add in the probability of A2 times the probability of B given A2. But we have calculated all these numbers already, so we can just take them straight from our previous slides and type them in. And the probability of A1 is 0.7, so that goes here and here, so we get these two numbers. Probability of B given A1 are these two numbers, 0.2. Uh, probability of A A2 is 0.3, and probability of B is A2. I'm sorry, probability of B given A2 is 0.9. So we just have 0.14 divided by, divided by 0.14 plus 0.27, which is 0 0.41. 0 0.14 divided by 0 0.41 is 0.34. So, big scary formula. It's really intimidating, um, but really it's just a couple bits of multiplication, a bit of addition, and some division. I mean, it's, it's actually not that bad. So, is it unfamiliar? Yes. Is it intimidating? Yes but it's not that bad. So uh, the process, you'll, you'll just have to get the hang of the process. It's, it's not that bad. Uh, it's not as bad as it looks. Then again, maybe that's not a very uh, strong statement. Maybe it looks really bad. So for it to not be as bad as it looks is rather easy. But in, in, anyway, the point of this is that this is good news because remember, we don't want to have to move our store. We don't want new competition. We want to be the, the top dog, right? So we originally thought that the probability of an approval was 70%. But this prior information or this new information is great news for us because this means that we can calculate that given this information, the probability of the approval has dropped 34%. It's less than half as likely as it was before. Well, that's pretty nice. Okay. Well, there's another way of solving this problem. Because remember, we've already computed some things, we've done some other steps to kind of skip some, some parts. Well, what if we have uh, a longer list of things? So we're going to need the same kind of homework, so to speak. You know, that's, I've done the same work ahead of time. But um, what if we have a longer list of things and it's not convenient to just write it in a fraction all at once? Well, there's a table approach. I promised you a table and you're going to get it. So um, what does this table look like? Well, uh, we're going to actually start out with, um, it's a total of five columns. Three of them are just input data. Just input data. So column one, the mutually exclusive events for which posterior probabilities are desired. So it's just a list of events. Column two, the prior probabilities for the events. So in our case, that's the 70, 30 percent that we saw from the very beginning. And then column three, the conditional probabilities of the new information given the events in column one. So those were the things that were given to us um, as the, uh, the, the other given data. So let's plug these in. So we have events A1 and A2. Prior probabilities for A1 and A2 are 0.7 and 0.3, which by the way, remember, the AI is a placeholder for a number. So AI could be A1, in which case it's 7. AI could be A2, in which case the probability is 0.3. And we should always get 1, 100% for our prior probabilities. Now, conditional probabilities, these were also given to us. 0.2 and 0.9 for the probability of B given AI. So we just write these in. They were given to us. Write them in. How about column four? Well, this is step two. So step one, write in your input data, I guess, and build the table. Build the table, write in your data. Step two, prepare the fourth column. Column four is done by computing the joint probabilities for each event and the new information B using the multiplication law, which means we're just multiplying the prior probabilities in column two by the corresponding conditional probabilities in column three. That's the multiplication law, right? That's, that's this right here. So literally, it's just multiply column two by column three. In this case, 0 0.7 times 0 0.2, 0 0.14, 0 0.3 times 0 0.9, 0 0.27. It's as simple as multiplication. Now, 
That tells us the point one four pr probability of the town council approving the zoning change and a negative recommendation by the planning board, and a point two seven probability of the town council disapproving the zoning change and a negative recommendation by the planning board. So both of these are given a negative recommendation. Something to keep in mind. Step three: sum the joint probabilities in column four, and this is the probability of the new information which we're calling event B, so the probability of B. In which case, we see 0.14 plus 0.27, showing an overall probability of 0.41 of a negative recommendation by the planning board. If you saw this uh, underline that we had here, it was actually on the previous slide, um, we simply add in probability of B equals 0.41. And that takes us to column five, step four. We're computing the posterior probabilities using the basic relationship of conditional probability. Just, just another formula. We take the probabilities A intersect B divided by the probability of B, which A intersect B are the joint probabilities in column four, and then probability of B we just compute it. It's the sum of the items in column four. So what that means is we simply take this 0.14 and divide it by 0.41, and that gives us about a third. 0.27 divided by 0.41 is about two thirds. So 34% and 66%, um, which means we now have 34%, 66% chance, relatively speaking, for A1 and A2. So these are our new probabil probabilities. We now know that the uh, probability has dropped of the bad news from 70% to 34%. I think that's it, yep. After this is a practice problem. So if you'd like to review this practice problem and take a stab at it, um, you can uh, practice with this. Of course, I'll be giving you some more practice problems in the coming days. So good luck, and uh, I'll see you guys in a few days.